The privilege of faith has been our ongoing topic. Tonight is lecture uh, number six. The base of our discussion since day number one has been a reminder to all of us, including our youth of today, that the faith that all of us believe in is a privilege given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that privilege in a time where people are searching for answers, searching for hope, searching for some light, we have all of those in our back pocket. For us now to leave that privilege or convert that privilege into kufr or leaving the path is rather unfortunate. And so it's important that we remind ourselves of the fact that no doubt this is a privilege from day number one. What's been given to us, what's been handed to us from our mothers and from our fathers is to be treated as a privilege. And we have begun now to kind of, you know, discuss this topic at length, defining the uh, word privilege, uh, using the Western approach of today's privilege, and debunking that and saying that's not what the deen means when it says privilege. It's not an unfair advantage or undeserving advantage that today's privilege comes about, either through the color of your skin or through your gender. And last night we talked about the fact that you'll only accept this faith to be a privilege when we accept the faith at the certainty level. And sometimes we simply ignore this privilege because we don't quite have that yaqeen inside of our faith. And that was yesterday's discussion. We cited the examples of the time of Fir'aun and Nabi Musa and how those who at one moment were under the immense control of Fir'aun once they saw the reality and Nabi Musa's uh, prophethood, that no matter what threat Fir'aun placed in front of them, they could not deny what they saw. And tonight, as I promised you guys last night, I wanted to make sure that we begin this discussion on looking at some of the more important, essential components of our faith. My premise from day number one has been that there has always been one deen. There is one deen today, there'll be one deen tomorrow. There's always been one Islam. Today is one Islam, tomorrow is also one Islam. There's not a thousand Islams out there. And the reason why sometimes we find this maybe ahsasi kamtari as you call it in Urdu, this a little bit of the apologetic inferior complex of the Shia of today is because we see ourselves as a minority, thus we must be those who branched off from the majority and make our way back into the majority. Meaning that Islam is one and we've branched off from that deen. That's incorrect. And inshallah today as we begin our discussion on Ghadir, we'll understand through the Quranic viewpoint that there is only one Islam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <laughs> Now, why did I choose Ghadir? Simple. Ghadir is that point where things now begin to define itself. Ghadir becomes the day of criteria. Yawm al ma'yar, they say. That now the filtering process is a day of Ghadir. Where now you truly begin to understand who believed in the prophethood of Rasulullah and whose belief was conditional. Keep in mind the verse in Surah Hajj I talked about. There are those who worship Allah on the edge of a cliff. So long as things go their way, subhana rabbil ala wa bihamdi. The moment things go a little bit against them, anqalaba ala wajhihi. They turn their face away from Allah. Keep that in mind throughout this discussion. Now, a lot of my elders know Ghadir very well. You know it better than I do. It's important, however, that we revive a little bit of that Ghadiri deen inside of us, especially for our youth. Yes, we gather on the on Eid al-Ghadir, and no doubt you come, but there's Urdu Shairi, which I'm sure my youth, as much as I love them, don't know a word of it. And so they don't quite get the message of Ghadir. And there is a lot of effort being done now by Wahhabism, by the Saudi regime, to, like I say, debunk the Shia ideology, and they begin with their efforts at Ghadir. And I'll present to you tomorrow what their viewpoint is. Nobody rejects Ghadir. Nobody can reject Khadir. It is one hadith that, that, that is mutawatir as they call it. Mutawatir is that hadith that so many people have narrated it, it's impossible for it to be a lie. So not one sect in Islam denies Khadir. They can't. 
But where, where, where the playing happens is that this idea of the sermon of the Holy Prophet had nothing to do with divine succession. In fact, it was, as one group claims, it was a resolving of a conflict between uh, Khalid ibn Walid and Amir al-Mu'mineen in Yemen. That we'll discuss tomorrow, inshallah. That's my cheap plug for tomorrow, inshallah. Tonight, however, let's look at some proofs. Just to remind ourselves, have that good feeling inside of us a little bit, right? Bring about that yaqeen I talked about last night, and we begin with Khadir. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. On the day of Ghadir, several verses were revealed onto the Holy Prophet at various times during this very monumental event. And as you know, it, it, it occurred after his last Hajj, where the Qafla and the caravan reached a place called Ghadir Khum. A little small pond back then. It's actual place called Ghadir Khum. And the moment that he arrives at this place, the Holy Prophet receives a wahi. Surah Ma'idah, verse number 67. Well, now he is commanded, Ya ayyuhar rasul. Now look at the use of the words Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses in this verse. Very, very carefully. This verse is enough for us to understand the ahmiyat and the importance of Ghadir. First of all, he does not use any other title but the business name of Rasulullah. First thing. Up and down the Quran, Yaseen, Ya ayyuhar the mudassir, Ahmad, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. But this one is that he says, Ya ayyuhar rasul. Okay? Now the example I'll give you, it's not the best example, but bear with me. Okay? There are moments where at work you are called by your first name, sometimes your last name. There are moments where, you're, where, you, where, where you are called by your title. Say, Mr. Vice President, please come here for a moment. Mr. CEO, Mr. Head of IT, and you know that once the title is used, it's a very serious mamullah right now. That now they're calling you by your very uh, responsibility inside the corporation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, says, Ya ayyuhar rasul. Okay, O oh my rasul. Ballig ma unzala ilayka min rabbik. Reveal now what has been revealed to you before from your Lord. So number one, the Prophet knew exactly what he was, what to, was what to, uh, to, to, to reveal on the moment of Ghadir. No surprises. If we break down this verse, it's very, very clear. Okay? The fail that's used in this verse of Surah Maidah 67 is a fail in Mazi. That it's been revealed to you already, now you make what's been revealed to you before revealed to the masses now that has come from your Lord. So we know whatever hukum or whatever comes out of the mouth of Rasulullah from this point is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not from his own shucks. And it's important that we understand that later on. And then very importantly, with a very stern tone, Allah says, وَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلَ If you don't do this, فَمَا بَلَّغْتَ رِسَالَاتَ It's as if you haven't done anything of your prophethood. It's serious now. Meaning, on one side you have 23 years of prophethood. On one side you have this moment in Ghadir. If this Ghadir is not done, this Rasalat is as if it's not done as well. Meaning the weight of the entire 23 years, and you can choose the, the battles, you can choose Hudaybiyah, you can choose Fatah Mecca, you can choose Shibba Abu Talib, whatever you want to choose, this group now in Ghadir, has gone through its fair share of problems. All to establish this Islam and this deen. All of those efforts, all the shuhada and badr and ahad and so on, on one side, ghadir on the other side. And it is a very equal mizan, a very equal scale, where one equals the other. So this is not a ma'muli announcement. It's not some ordinary announcement. The moment that that verse comes out, oh yes, and the, 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 the verse goes on to say, again, very interestingly, Allah says, Wallahu ya'asimuka min an nas. Ajib. He says, I will, Allah will surely protect you from the people. Now, this is supposed to be a celebratory moment. The Prophet did one Hajj his entire life, coming back from Hajj. He's asked now to reveal. Okay? No doubt the Prophet now knows exactly what's coming. 
History says it's not that he was hesitant, the Holy Prophet. It was that there was a look of concern on him, not for him, but for his people. These were not kuffar amongst him. No, the mushrikeen, munafiqeen, nobody. These were people who did hajj with him. These were people who now traveled from Medina son into hajj. Very few came, as you know and you should know, that Amir al-Mu'min was not with the Holy Prophet in Medina when they went towards Mecca. He was in Yemen, for reasons I'll explain tomorrow. He met the Prophet outside of Mecca and did hajj with him. And he brought forth with him some people. The point is, the numbers that I have read, the bare minimum are 90,000, the maximum is 120,000. It's a large crowd. A large crowd of believers. For some reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala feels the need to remind the Holy Prophet that, look, I have your back. Don't worry. Move forward and deliver what you need to deliver. Okay? Wallahu ya'asimuka min nas I'll protect you from the people. Why the protection? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala realized, the Holy Prophet even realized, that fasting in the month of Ramadan was easy. Going to war in Badr was easy. Conquest of Mecca was easy. Shibi Abu Talib was easy. Everything was easy. Excepting Amir al-Mu'mineen as the successor was not easy for many. And there's bound to be some backlash. And there was backlash. So Allah felt the need to say, look, my Rasul, Ya Ayyuhar Rasul, move forward now. Reveal what I'm telling you to reveal. If you're concerned about people or the backlash, Wallahu Ya'asimu Kamin al Nas. I will protect you from the people. And then Allah again, very ajib now. For some reason, He feels the need to remind the Holy Prophet. Inna Allah la yahdil qawm al kafirin. Allah does not guide the people who are the kuffar. There's no kuffar here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are all the believers, apparently. These are all people who said la bayt to the Holy Prophet. Why bring up the kuffar? Because this is where that filtering process happens. This is where the mu'min becomes clear and the mu'min doesn't become clear. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Now at that moment now, Jibreel comes to the Holy Prophet and tells him to instruct his people that those who have gone ahead of you back towards Medina, bring them back. All the things, all you've all heard. Those who, are, who have not yet quite left Mecca and Hajj, wait for them. Meaning what? Let's gather everybody together. And the Prophet did. The Prophet, the prophet waited and he waited and he waited. In the meantime, he had this member constructed. Now there's immense symbolism in this instruction from Jibra'il. Immense symbolism. And the symbolism is this, that him and Amir al-Mu'mineen are the standard. Anybody else ahead of them or behind them are not included in that standard. Meaning there will be those individuals who will go ahead of Amir al-Mu'mineen and begin to believe him as Ali Allah, Ali Allah, Ali Allah, which exists today by the way. Then there are those individuals who will stay behind Amir al-Mu'mineen and simply see him as nothing but an ordinary man who could be pretty good, pretty good with the sword. And that's it. The Prophet is saying, by me waiting for those to go ahead to come back and those that were behind to move forward, I'm sending a message that the true faith belongs in the same plateau as Amir al-Mu'mineen. Don't go ahead of him, don't go behind him. That's not the symbolism that we're after. The idea is that on the same plateau as Amir al-Mu'mineen. Believe him as I have presented for you to believe in him. Okay? At that moment now, the member is constructed. And this khutbah is delivered. And I'm going very quickly. There's an immense amount of details that are written about this very event. The Prophet Allah delivered a three-hour khutbah in the burning sand. Individuals have to wrap their feet around their own abba or around their own clothes to make sure the sand doesn't burn them. And he, left, he leaves behind a several pieces of information that are critical that I'm leaving behind tonight. The one verse that sometimes gets lost in the discussion on Ghadir, we have the two very famous verses from Surah Maidah, 6, 7, number 3. But Surah Ahzab's verse number 6 is extremely crucial in this khutbah of Ghadir, extremely crucial. And I'll tell you why. 
you know that the entire bahas on Ghadir is, revolves around the word Mawla. That much all of you know. Mawla in Arabic has 20 plus different meanings to it. Okay? To give you an example of how different the meanings are, every Friday we read Zayat Imam Zaman, inshallah. In that, there's a very ajib line. Okay? <laughs> Assalamu alayka ya Mawla ya ana Mawlaka. If I was to translate that, it would say, Oh, peace be upon you, Mawla, I am your Mawla. Right? What happened there? Obviously, Mawla here means two different things. Peace be upon you, O Master, Ana Mawlaka, I am your servant. So one meaning of Mawla is servant, one meaning of Mawla is master. Two opposite meanings, beyond 20 plus meanings. So any time in any language, where you have one word that's used by an author, or a khatib, or an alim, or, or whoever the case may be, then context of that is extremely important. The Prophet realized that, Allah realizes that. So he begins this critical process of eliminating the various meanings of Mawla until you're bound to get to one meaning of Mawla. And he begins with this first in Surah Ahzab, verse number 6. Where first now he begins to take this very kulli khutbah and brings it down to the crux of the matter. The crux of the matter was the successorship of Amid al-Mu'mini. And now he begins. And the verse says, Al-Nabiyu, awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. Very, very carefully. The Prophet says, the Prophet is the one who has more authority. Awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim has more authority on the mu'maneen than they have over themselves. Clear verse of the Qur'an. And the usage of this verse by the Holy Prophet in this khutbah is filled with wisdom. Because now he knows that you can take mawla to mean a thousand things. And many have. They have completely you know, uh, rejected the khutbah of Ghadir to simply mean a, a, an announcement of friendship of the Holy Prophet to Amir al-Mu'maneen. Obviously, by the inclusion of this verse, this awla here only means authority and authority alone. And then right after that, almost as if to emphasize for a second time now, he says, Alasta awla bikum mi anfusikum? Do I not have authority over you more so than you have over yourself? Do I not make things that you might think are halal haram on you and haram halal on you and halal haram on you, etc., etc.? Yes. Can I make things that are obligation on you? Yes, you can. I have complete authority over you that you have upon yourself. And they all said, bala. Yes. Absolutely. So you are our mawla. You have awla over us. This authority that's higher than us. For the second time now, after the wahi of Allah, his sunnati. Rasulullah Salat says what? That I now have more authority over you. Context now is delivered for a second time. Now a third time he again delivers that same context. Man kunto mawla. For those who accept, accept me as their mawla. Again the mawla here could mean nothing else but that inclusion of Surah Azab. And everyone says yes. Absolutely. Grabs Amir al some verses say his, some, 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 some versions say his hand went up, some verses say his whole body went up, such that nobody of the 90 plus thousand individuals can ever say, we had no idea who he was talking about. Brought him to the member, held him up high, man kuntu mawla, fahada ali mawla. For whoever I have this authority, this authority now is given to this individual Ali. For any other meaning of Mawla to be accepted at that moment of Mankunta Mawla, if you were simply to extract this one sentence, it would not make lexical sense throughout the khutbah. The Prophet is the Habib of Allah. He's Khatm al-Anbiya, the seal of prophethood. Nothing he says is a blunder or a mistake or a, a, a fault of his. Everything he has said since day number one is calculated. Very well thought out. Even when he thinks there's a moment of confusion, he clears it up and then he delivers a message. Three times before announcing Mawla Ali's walayat, does he make sure that Mawla is not misunderstood. From the kalam of Allah to his own kalam twice, and then finally to announcing Mawla Ali as the thing. Any other acceptance 
is simply the idea of them trying to now change history to make their own belief now understandable. Because the reality is, even, even at the Aqli point, nobody would accept the fact that the Prophet would lead this entire empire to nobody afterwards. All the Prophets before him announced a successor. The three Khulafa after him, at least the two of them, announced a successor. And for some reason, this Prophet of Allah felt the need that after 23 years of building this empire, that I'm going to leave this empire void or make it very, very uh, uh, implicit as to who it is that is my successor. It's not possible. He would leave Medina and Mecca for one day and leave behind a successor. He would leave, let's say, and go to Tabuk and he would leave behind a successor. He would migrate towards Medina and leave Ali behind in Mecca. Even for an hour outside of his city, he would make sure in that one hour, there's somebody there to run the affairs. Now a man who was so careful about one hour, one day, one week, how could he leave this world and not leave the entire empire in someone else's hand? This happens now. He then announces that you are to line up and congratulate Amir al and myself. Bakhin, bakhin. Okay? You don't congratulate them unless it is an announcement of successorship. Now, the other verse that comes down right after that from Surah Maida, as all of you know, is the announcement of the perfection of the deen. Again, very carefully now, verses you've heard a thousand times. The verse is, وَالْيَوْمْ أَكْمَلْتَ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُمْ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيْتُ لَكُمْ الْإِسْلَامَ الدِّينَ Please, very carefully. On this day, I've perfected your religion, that's fine. I have completed your ni'mat for you. And I've chosen for you the deen of Islam. When does this happen? After the announcement of the walayat of Amir al I have been saying since day number one. I said it again in the beginning of my, of, of, of my lecture. Islam has been one, is one today, will always be one tomorrow. For anyone to believe that Islam can be accepted without Ghadir goes against this very clear verse in the Quran. In fact, it is very obvious, as I've said since day number one, that one Islam that has to be believed in, that deen e haq is that Islam that travels through Ghadir. Allah says Ghadir happens, and then I announce, وَرَوِيْتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ الدِّينَ After this announcement now, I have done everything I can to make sure the deen is flawless. Now I have chosen for you the deen, and he calls it specifically Islam inside the verse. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So anyone who rejects this notion of Ghadir, anyone who doesn't accept this notion to be its proper establishment, goes against the very deen of Islam as laid out in the Quran. It's very, very open. There's no confusion about it. That in a nutshell is Ghadir. Okay. Now, what I wanted to pinpoint in the next five minutes very quickly, were the two different usage of the words in this Surah Ma'idah, verse number three. Kamal and Tamam are two different words in Arabic that are very close in meaning. Very, very quickly. One means perfection, one means completion. Now the question is that you'll ask me, that Rasul Baha'i, fine, great, sold. Zadir was about Imam Ali, perfect. Now what do we do? What do we do now? It's a good question. And look at the usage of the words by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very, very carefully. Perfection and completion, Kamal and Tamam. To give you some idea, let me give you a very simple example. In Canada, in Toronto, where I'm from, if you were to buy a house from a builder directly, you would go there, they have a sign up, closing, let's say, in August of 2021, let's say, for example. You would go and you would, on a map, you would choose a house that you want, okay? They ask for a certain deposit, let's say 5% or 15%, let's say, of the actual price of the house. You give that deposit, and the house is yours. And as you get closer to the actual closing date of 2021, they send you updates. When finally that moment that day arrives now, where they call you, say, Mr. Jaffrey, your house is ready, you can pick up the keys at our office. You go, you take your wife, and he gives you the keys, you take the keys, and you right away give those keys to your wife. Don't even think about it. <laughs> And say, honey, you please open the door to your house. I'm nothing but a khadim and a servant in this house for you. 
And she opens the house, and right away, what do you do is you review the house. Now, in Toronto, they have a two-year warranty. In two years, if the builder has messed up, from the cupboards to the knobs to the toilets to the carpet color, then you can ask them, and they'll come and fix it. Okay? All right. The house is complete. It's complete. You walk in, and right away, your wife now says, well, that's not the cupboards I chose. So she writes on a sticky pad, cabinets need to be changed, and she sticks it on the, on, on the cabinets. Not the knobs I chose either. Not the color I chose either. For two years now, you go through the entire house, bit by bit, making sure that what? That the way that I wanted the house to be is exactly how the house should be. So while the house is complete, it's not perfect. Because perfection is that the way I wanted it is how it should be given to me. So in the process, while you take a complete house, for two years now, your wife is perfecting the completion of your house. Perfecting the completion of your house. In those two years, the builder comes, changes the carpet, says, I'm sorry about that, repaints your house, you know, changes the cupboards, and now after two years, your house is complete, and your house is perfect as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as a closing discussion, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممتم عليكم نعمتي I've perfected your religion, I've completed your blessing. Meaning what? That yes, no doubt, Allah gave us this complete na'mat, but it's up to us throughout our life to perfect the completion of that blessing. How do we do that? We make sure that in every aspect of our life, it's not just a celebration of Ghadir, it's a following amalan of Ghadir as well. That everything that Amir Muhammad has laid out for us, we follow that path as well. And we entirely, just like your wife, goes through every corner of the house, we also do muhasaba and go through every corner of our own soul and our own amal to see where can I fix this and fix that. Does Amir Muhammad want this paint to be this color or my amal to be this color or my slot to be this color if not then we spend our entire life perfecting the completion of the ni'mat of the walayat of Amir al-Mu'mineen Sallu ala Muhammad wa So my brothers and my sisters, the very first thing that we have to get through to our children in this day and age, where the Saudi regime is pouring billions of dollars to dismantle our ideology, it starts with Ghadir. And everything else follows. Once the walayat of the Ahl al-Bayt are accepted, everything else that comes after that is accepted. Everything from sujood on khak to the way that we pray, to the way that we do azadari, to our khump system, to our maraji system. If ghadir is shakki, everything else will follow after that. Let's fortify ghadir, build on that, and then move forward. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Oh. We ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our qaleel ibadat insha'Allah. We ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that in this era of doubt and shak, where it seems as if we are questioning those things that should be very obvious to us, we ask you Allah to bless us with the ni'mat of yaqeen and certainty insha'Allah. We ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to inject us with pride into our deen and understand it's a privilege and a sharaf that's been given to us. We ask you Allah, there's so much bloodshed in Yemen, in Bahrain, in Palestine, in Iraq, in Syria, Pakistan, wherever you see innocent lives being killed. We ask you Allah to weaken the hands of the enemies of humanity, inshallah. And we ask you all to please, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to strengthen the musta'az of all of the world. And finally, Allah, we ask you, to make us isqabil and worthy of Imam Zaman al-Zuhur, to make us stand beside him when he comes, inshaAllah.